I want, I want to meet you this afternoon in Paul's letter to the Galatians. I, I'm going to tell you up front that I come into this second session very lightly prepared. And why I, what I mean by that is that I didn't prepare a full sermon for this afternoon, for this second session. Part of that was because I didn't know for sure how this would all flow. Um, I knew we were doing a session and I know I'd like to take the time if we have it to answer your questions if you have them. And, and I certainly want to have time to talk downstairs to anyone and everyone who wants to talk. Um, but also I didn't because sometimes I hear that sound from the spirit that that tells me be lightly prepared here so that you can step with me where we need to go um, so I I'm, I'll tell you that I'm lightly prepared I won't make any promises as to how long we will go because I know better than doing stupid things like that because I end up going twice as long as I thought I would almost like a joke from the Lord on me freedom in this place I feel it I, I felt freedom in this place at our first session that was why we ended up going down a few roads there that I didn't plan on there as well. So, uh, but I am going to intentionally try to keep it a little shorter because I do want to take the time to actually converse and talk with you, not talk at you. Although I do believe this is a conversation, I think if we do this right, I don't like that phrase, but I'm going to use it. If we do it right, um, communicating the word is like a conversation between the listener and the viewer. Let me, let me give you a little test. Have you watched sermons on YouTube okay I'll just use mine because we got thousands of them out there if you watch me on YouTube you get to the end you go oh, that was good and then you come live and you leave and go man that was better okay it wasn't better it might not even have been as good but the difference is you're there and when you watch and this is why don't make your church online church Okay, because when you watch, you are watching the atmosphere, the conversation of someone else. You can be greatly blessed by it. It can supplement your diet. It can help answer questions about the Bible. It can teach you great things. But the speaker cannot read what it's doing to you in the moment because it's recorded. It's some other spot. But when you're in the room... You are part of the conversation whether you know it or not. You're communicating. It's not just body language either. It's way deeper than that. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not reading body language and, and arms and sweat and whether you closed your eyes or not. I'm not that well trained. But I have done this enough to listen and watch as the Spirit does some things He wants to do and then listen for the roads He takes you on. And, that, and that's why you get to the end and someone will go, man... I was sitting there thinking, gosh, what about this? And then it gets covered. They go, how did that happen? I go, that's what it, the difference in being in the room. And so we felt, I felt that in our first session, and I already sensed the Holy Spirit doing a little bit of that in this as well. And, and so for me, that's, that's exciting because that means you don't exactly know where you're going to go, but you can hold hands with the one that knows where you're going to go and says, let's go there together. Galatians chapter 3, let's read a few verses. Beginning in verse 26, and I want to read through the end of Paul's third chapter. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I will state as a proposition, my opinion of course, but I say that up front, that I think the last four verses of Galatians chapter 3 are the climactic theology of the Apostle Paul and easily the most controversial things that he writes in a single paragraph in the entirety of his written ministry. 
I also will further that with this. I do not believe that Paul assumed he was writing canon ever. I do not think that Paul assumed that he was ever writing something by which the church in perpetuity would govern themselves. But I will say that this paragraph we read, for me, is the climactic theological peak of Paul's theology, whereby every other Pauline verse should be interpreted. And, and the reason, you go, man, that's, that's a big lens. It is. And the reason I say that is for this cause. It's in this passage that Paul sings the music of the new covenant in perfect pitch. There's a lot to say about covenantal theology, blood, animals being sacrificed, commitments on both sides of the aisle. How did that look in the cross and the resurrection and the, and the ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And you could go on pages and pages and pages of covenantal theology and what that looks like. But at the end of the day, the theology of Paul matches Jesus better in Galatians 3.28 than any other moment in Paul's ministry. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. But you are all one in Christ Jesus. Never again does Paul hit this perfect pitch note that sings the song of the new covenant like this. In Christ, there's absolutely no difference in people groups and gender and race and economy and society and governments and culture and education. And I know I put a few more in there, but it's the same harmonic note that Paul's singing of the New Covenant theology. In Christ, every wall of division and separation is gone, and there's total equality in Jesus. It never gets that good again in Paul. I'm not, I'm not cutting the rest of Paul's writings down. We're all that way. We preach a clunker once in a while. It's just a dud. It's better when you're like at your own church and you preach it than when you take it on the road and preach it. Don't take the dud on the road. You don't take, leave the dud at home. I got some duds in my catalog. I know it. I might leave them up because I figure maybe it'll, somebody will like it. I might hit a double once in a while. Every now and then a triple, I'm not very fast. It needs to clear the wall for me to get all the way around. Every now and then I do that. My, base, my analogies are almost always baseball. Paul has some clunkers. I'm okay in saying that. See, I'm not a disciple of Paul. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I don't filter my Christianity through whether or not Paul lands it just right. I think sometimes Paul lands it really right. And sometimes it's a dud. When he closes the Corinthian letters in 2 Corinthians 16, 22, when he said, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. And I get to the end of that verse and I go, you could have done better. I mean, you could have, you could have landed softer, Paul. If anyone doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. He opens the Galatian letter with, if anyone preaches anything other than what I'm preaching, you can feel it coming, can't you? <laughs> Let him be double cursed. Oh, well, Paul, calm down. If anyone preaches anything other than what I'm preaching, let him be double cursed. You go, well, yeah, it's great, pure grace, or they ought to be cursed. Don't, don't take your theology from the wrong side of the slope of the Apostle Paul. Your theology is Jesus-centric. Your, your Christianity is Christocentric. It's not Pauline-centric. It's Christocentric. It's Christ in the center. I don't go through the Gospels and land on a Jesus statement and go, well, we, can, we don't have to live by that. <laughs> Christ is who I am disciplined by, discipled by, and into. And so are you. And so I don't... I don't have to land with Paul when in Ephesians chapter 6 he tells slaves to obey their masters. 
I, I live in a part of the United States that landed with Paul for centuries as if that was God speaking to all slaves everywhere across time to obey their masters and let that be the law of the land. And that was the sermon being preached in the pulpits using Paul. I don't have to land with Paul when in his hyper-complementarianism about the roles of women in church leadership where it's fine if they take care of the nursery, but don't let them pray over the offering. I don't have to land with Paul there. I... But I land with Paul on in Christ. There's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, for all are one in Jesus. It's why I say it's in that moment that Paul sings the sweet, perfect pitch music of the new covenant. Other times, maybe he's out of tune. And I'm okay with that because he's human. I'm not a disciple of Paul. My theology lands on Christ. Paul helps round it out. Paul helps inform me. And sometimes he helps greatly inform me. And so does James. And so does John. And so does Peter. But it's Christ who's the heartbeat of this verse. So I want to build this little moment around where Paul hits it just right. Where he hits it in the sweet spot. That in Christ there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile. And look around that verse to really find how Paul couches that. 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now we know Paul's sonship is genderless because two verses later, there's neither male nor female. So Paul is not presenting a sonship gospel at the expense of daughterhood. He's presenting a sonship gospel that includes daughterhood. Mind-blowing time if sonship gospel includes daughterhood, the fatherhood of God includes motherhood. So whatever's in mom and whatever's in dad is in your God. Okay. I know we hate it if you call him mother God. And I, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to present mother God so you turn off for the rest of the sermon. But, but I, I, I just want you to see that Paul, Paul lays out sonship and then follows it with get your mind off gender. Okay. Two verses later, get your mind off gender, here's sonship. So when we talk about sons, we're talking about daughters. What we're really talking about is familial. The family tie that binds what connects us to God as not just disciples, distant followers, slave servants, and all these things might work in helping us to understand it, but to really land on it, we land on sons. So you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus because for Paul, he's the most Christocentric preacher we have in the New Testament. It's why we call him the great minister of grace because Paul, for the areas that he fails, and he does because he's human, doesn't fail to bring us back to Jesus repeatedly where our theology slides you can see the hand of the epistles Paul sliding the church back to center back to that center pole that is Christ so I I think building ministry is more than building buildings building ideas writing books laying out theology or doctrine but it's building people around the center pole that is Christ pushing the edges of their life closer back in towards Christ in towards Christ in how they live and how they think and how they love For as many as you as were baptized, as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so for Paul, the faith that he speaks of in 26 is the baptism into Christ of 27. Put those two pieces of theology together. Faith in Christ, baptized into Christ. Now the counter argument to Paul's climactic next verse among some scholars is that what Paul's actually trying to do is remove you from circumcision so that women know that they have the same rights as men. And so because there's no circumcision, Paul says now there's neither male nor female, uh, bond nor free Jew nor Gentile. Uh, That's reading into Paul what we don't know is if Paul's putting it on the back of his circumcision argument in Galatians and saying, well, now that we don't need circumcised, there's not that distinction. I can't preach from silence. I won't say what I don't know Paul was thinking. But what I do know that Paul has done is revolutionary. Because in the world of Paul's day, there were clear distinctions between all of these things. Jew and Gentile, male and female, bond and free. And Paul was revolutionary in that, in his own Jewish heritage, 
He was speaking things that were outside of his Judaism and outside of his heritage, pushing the boundaries of what was considered acceptable or normal. Just as I said, he likes to bring us into the center pole. He also likes to push the boundaries of what's acceptable or normal out towards Christ rather than around Moses or around Torah or around the Ten Commandments or around Temple Judaism, but to push the boundaries out towards Jesus in a space that might not look as religious as he was raised. And while his religion might not agree that there's neither Jew nor Gentile, his culture most definitely did not agree that there was neither bond nor free. So Paul teaches all of us in the faith that we don't wait on our religion to catch up and we don't wait on our society to catch up. We don't wait on our religion to catch up to our there's neither Jew nor Gentile because his religion was never going to catch up to that. <laughs> we don't wait on our society to catch up that there's neither bond nor free. The Roman Empire lived on bond and free. Their entire economy was built on bond and free. Paul doesn't wait for the world to change in order for him to have convictions. He doesn't wait for it to line up with society in order for him to have beliefs. He's willing to push the envelope towards Jesus. We've let our ideology so hijack good words that we can't even use them in proper context anymore. Like, for instance, I believe in the inclusive love of God. I believe that God's love includes everyone Thus, the inclusive love of God. Okay? That's what I mean. But, but see, you can't even say inclusive because we've so politicized and idealized our terminology that we don't have room where to actually push the fences towards Christ because we're scared we'll fall into a different camp politically or ideologically. What we see in Paul and Galatians 3 is a fearlessness to push towards Christ in spite of the fact that his terms are going to be misunderstood by everyone. But he's using the only ones he knows how to use because for Paul, he sees that it no longer matters if you were born into the tribe of Issachar or you were born in the barbarian Gaul of southern Europe. Because to Paul, Christ is what would make you brothers. Not Reuben and Gad and Dan and circumcision, but Christ. And so for Paul, Paul sees that whether you're an Italian winemaker in the countryside or a Jewish man circumcising his eight-day-old son at temple, your only hope is Christ. Amen. That whether you're a man in a society in which it was all about men, that the entire society was patriarchal. That a woman had no rights. She couldn't buy property. She couldn't vote. She couldn't save her own money. She couldn't be educated. That her only hope was to attach herself to a man who could do all of those things for her. Paul steps against it. Pushes the fence out. And says, in Christ, there's neither a position of power in the house or a position of inferiority. In Christ, everybody's the same. And for Paul, in a Roman Empire built on masters and slave relationships and bond servants and committing your entire livelihood over to someone because you're too in debt to pay it off and thus you indenture yourself over to someone with no hope of ever being released from that. Paul says, in Christ, there's neither a master or a slave. And society disagreed with him. And religion disagreed with him. And even maybe the early church disagreed with him. And this is why I say he's singing the song of the new covenant. Because it doesn't wait on society to line up. It isn't afraid to grab the terms stolen by ideology. And it centers itself on that center pole, that man, Christ Jesus. What a moment by Paul. What a spectacular, mind-blowing moment by the Apostle Paul. And then... As if he hadn't said enough, 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs, according to the promise. 
and maybe there's no more subversive statement, to the faith of Saul of Tarsus than Galatians 3.29. Because Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of Pharisees from the house of Benjamin, which means he can trace his lineage through the house of Benjamin all the way back to Abraham. His genealogical records are setting in that temple at the time Paul writes this in Galatians because every Jewish man alive could trace his lineage through his family circumcision records back to Abraham. Those genealogical records were in the temple in Jerusalem. And Paul could trace it back and you could trace all the way back to Abraham and you could stand in pride on the Genesis promise to Abraham that I will bless your seed and all the nations of the earth will be blessed and in you the nations of the earth shall be blessed and that Abraham received God by faith and he followed him and God counted it to him for righteousness and therefore you could receive your blessings simply because of somebody else's faith. And Paul changes the article of the faith from Abraham to Jesus. So no longer are you Abraham's seed because your daddy and your granddaddy and your great-granddaddy belonged in Abraham's family and they circumcised you at eight days, years, eight days old and now you can trace your lineage all the way back. No longer. Doesn't count anymore. Now, if you know Christ, you get grafted in your Abraham's seed. No more subversive statement to his religion, to his heritage, to his family, to his people, to his theology. He has thrown down the gauntlet. You cannot go back from this. This is the Rubicon of Christianity. There's no going back. You don't get to go to the family reunion now. You are cut off from that. And for Paul, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And that hasn't changed. If you are Christ, you get the promise. Not because you are the recipient of the promise, but because Christ is the recipient of the promise. Good news. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, all of the promises of God are in Christ, and they are yes, and they are amen to the glory of his name. All of the promises of God are not in a geographical piece of property on the other side of the globe. All of the promises of God are not in national Israel. All of the promises of God are not in keeping the Ten Commandments. All of the promises of God are not in this church house. All of the promises of God are not in following this guy in his ministry. That'll get you none of the promises of God. I don't care how good you are at all of those things. That's what gets Paul in trouble. That statement, that's the one. It's the same one gets you in trouble now. Nothing's changed. All the promise, because we want the promises of God to be when we do good. We just want the grace of God to be when we do bad. Right? A lot of people ministering grace see grace as that which takes care of your sin, not that which empowers you to live the life of God. And so we want grace when we mess up, but we want brownie points when we do good. And you go, well, not me. Are you sure? Because how many of your prayers had this little chestnut of an intro to it? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I don't think I've ever prayed so much, read so much, or gave so much in my life. I've been dedicated to you, Lord. This has been a season, Father, where I've really been seeking your face, and I'm believing you're going to bless me. Tweak those words just a little bit. You can probably find yourself in there somewhere. And that's under the new covenant, how we pray. Basically, here's my resume the last week. I mean, shower it down if you got any. Rather than, I'm broken, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I can't do any of this on my own, I need you to do everything. I don't have anything to offer you. That last one's grace, by the way. That's the grace of God that goes, you can't earn this, you can't deserve. So the promises of God are in Christ, and they're yes and they're amen, and all of us who are in Christ are Abraham's seed, and that makes us heirs because we're in Christ, not because we're good. You don't get from God because you're good. You get from God because of Christ. Let me say it again. 
You'll never get anything from God because you do the right thing. If it takes you doing the right thing, you don't need Jesus. You just need to do the right thing. And the gospel being preached that excludes Jesus as the centerpiece of the promise but puts any of your works in as the centerpiece of the promise is a gospel void of the Jesus of the New Testament. So when we get up and say things like America is about to be judged because of what she's done, God's going to do this because America did that, that hurricane's going to kill somebody because those people down there voted this in, they did that over there, they can expect an earthquake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you expect when you mock God? We don't understand what Christ did as the centerpiece of the promise of God. Any blessing we have is Christ, not our goodness. Amen. Amen. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Hurricanes happen. Tornadoes happen. Earthquakes happen. They kill more people than ever before because we, well... Some of them don't kill more people than ever before. The truth is probably the opposite. We're safer than we've ever been, to be quite honest. But the devastation might be greater than ever before because, well, we got more people living in spots than we've ever had living in spots before. And we're better at counting. I'm, I'm not being cold, but I'm being truthful. We're, we're better at counting. We're better at tracking things. And it because we got smartphones and screens, and we can hear instant information, we all think the world's worse. That's like the most universally, that's the only universally accepted truth right now in America. Both sides of the aisle. That's the only thing you can get people to agree on. Is, go, is, is the world better or worse? And 99,999 of them out of 100,000 will go, yep, world's worse. You go, how do you know it's worse? Because I can tell you what it was like when I was a kid. And we always go back to when we were a kid, which by the way, Everybody's life was better when they were a kid. I mean, you didn't have any responsibilities. Like, stuff was really simple. And you go, yeah, and stuff was cheaper. Yeah, because your dad bought it. <laughs> of course it was cheaper. <laughs> I mean, you went anything you did. And so we all picked that time as the time. I don't think it's worse. All right. I think we got more information than we ever had before, and we're being overloaded to process information happening on the other side of the world in real time. And not only is it making us think the world is worse, it's also making us feel bad because we don't feel bad enough. Because the truth is, is that you feel bad for the things closely connected to you. You don't have enough space to feel bad for everybody's pain. You just don't. Be released of that in Jesus' name. Only Jesus can suffer under everyone's pain. You can't. You're not designed to suffer under everyone's pain. Do you hear about something happening in a village somewhere and you go, boy, that's tough. And somebody goes, yeah, you'd feel different if it was your street. Wow. Yes. Yes. Because I know those people and I know their name and I've been in their yard for a barbecue and their family. Yes, I feel different. Don't make me feel bad about feeling different for people who are close to me. You're not the savior of the world. You can't take on the responsibility of it. So be released from that responsibility. Let Christ and his finished work Take that responsibility and we spread that light. I'll, I'll land here. I think that when Paul says you are sons in verse 26, put on Christ in 27, all distinctions broken down made one in 28, and an heir that receives the promise in 29, I think that Paul is showing a progression of Christian theology in who we are in Christ and our personal confirmation, wrong word, our personal revelation of that transformation process. So we go into sonship and put on who he is in exchange for who we are. That's a process. That as I grow into sonship, I put on who he is. As I do that, I recognize all the old distinctions I had between me and other people are gone. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. I'm not something in him, and you're not something in him. All that stuff begins to vanish when we start to become one family. When we're tribal, our tribe's better than your tribe. Our country's better than your country. Our language's better than your language. Our money's better than your money. Our people better than your people. Feel it? Sound familiar? Yeah. When it's familial, it ceases to be that way 
Because we become one, we become family. And then finally, we become heirs. Because only family can be heir. Right. So family become heir. With that in mind, I do believe that the entire earth are the children of God. I believe that because of Acts 17, where Paul finds himself in Athens talking to a people who are worshiping a statue to the unknown God. And Paul says to them, let me tell you about that God. What a great intro to a sermon. Goes up to the statue. They don't. They, this is a God we don't know. Paul goes, let me tell you about it. He said, in Him, we live. I think he might have even pointed. I, which I, I know kind of blows our mind. He wouldn't have pointed. I don't know. Maybe so. He's in Athens. And he points. And he goes, in Him, we live and breathe and move and have our being. And he is not very far away from us. And in verse 29, he says, For you are all the offspring of God. Now, can you imagine saying that in a room full of heathens? <laughs> These Athenian idol worshipers, Paul goes, You're all the offspring of God. In him we live, we move, we breathe, we have our being. He is not very far away from you. You are all the offspring of God. So I believe Paul's early message is the whole world's the offspring of God. But Paul's climactic message is it's time that you come to faith in Christ to know that you're the sons of God. And to me, this is the gospel. God loves you. You're His children. Because you're His children, He loves you unbelievably. Because you love your kids like nobody's business. All of you. Offspring of God. What I want you to know is that you're the offspring of God. Because when you start to believe it, you'll start to take it personal. And once you start to take it personal, you'll realize that you're a son or a daughter. And when you realize you're a son or a daughter, you'll put on Christ, break down the distinctions, and start living according to your inheritance. Your identity will grow. John said it this way, For as many of us as have faith in His name, he hath given us the power to call ourselves sons of God. Amen. We get to do that because of faith in His name. We get to call ourselves sons of God. Now, I, I, I believe that this is because of Jesus. I, I, will, I will say, I, I saved this for the final salvo. Um, there's a lot of people in the world looking for God they're looking for God in all kinds of places and they're looking for God in all kinds of religions and if they truly are the offspring of God I believe they're having multiple revelations of God's love even through their religions even through religions that you might deem false revelations of God's love His grace and His mercy I think it's happening all over the globe in all different religions. However, I'm such a Jesus fanatic that I choose Jesus not only for the theology that I believe He died on the cross for my sins and He harrowed hell and He resurrected from the dead and He ascended into heaven and He gave me the Holy Spirit and He lives inside of me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. All of those theological things I believe very much. But because I believe that Jesus was the express image of God trying to show man what it would look like if they lived in union with their Father instead of if they tried to live for their God. Because they've been trying to live for their God for centuries. Jesus came to show us that we are not living for God, we are living from God. And we do that by taking our dad's name. That makes us his son or his daughter. We don't live for our dad. We live from our dad every time we write that last name down. I live from who my father is. And if I knew it, I might live like it. I believe this because of a, a thousand reasons, but one I like to land on with both feet. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And yet we've hijacked that verse in Christianity and we've made it an exclusiveness 
to Christianity verse. What we've done is we quoted something like this. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. He's the only life of heaven. He's the only truth of heaven. We insert what Jesus didn't insert. And I'm not here to make an argument about heaven as a post-mortem place. But Jesus didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets to heaven but by me. What he did say, pause, he also didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody knows God without me. But he did say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to him as Father but by me. Because if you want to know God as more than a God, off somewhere in a distant place, hoping you'll jump high enough to please Him, you're going to find Him when you look at Jesus. Because He's going to cease to be God and He's going to begin to be Father. And when He becomes Father, you cease to be offspring and you start to become sons. And once you become sons, you trade on His name because it's yours. And you live out of His name and you live up to the name and you live from the name and you pass the name along because it is your economy it's your father if I want to tell the offspring of God wouldn't you like to know him as your father instead of as your God you say well I don't even believe in God I know there's no one here saying this but this might be an answer you can ponder I don't even believe there is a God. I don't, I don't believe it when people say that. Because the moment you take God away, you just become God. You answer to something. You answer to you. You, you just become the one palatable version you can swallow. You just can't swallow the other versions, but you can handle you. Well, bless your heart. You can handle you being in charge of the universe. Well, how well are you doing? You can handle you being top of the mountain and making the decisions. How well is that going for you? And we know the answer is terrible. And then you go, well, you can poke holes in that argument. Obviously, we can try and intellectualize our way into why we don't need Him. A is God, B as Father. But the same people will turn right around when society goes to hell and say, well, this is what happens when the family breaks down. I didn't expect these kids to live. They don't have a dad at home. And it's incredible to me how we suddenly land on perfect theology. Perfect theology. The second we start seeing people sin. Because perfect theology would say, what would happen if you knew you had a father? What would happen if you lived in his house and you ate at his table and you traded with his ring on your finger and you walked around with his shoes on your feet and you wore his robes of righteousness and you signed your name as his name, how would you talk? How would you live? How would you love? How would you respond? What would your navigation system be throughout the world? And would it be better if in that moment you knew you were his kid than that you knew you were God? It's amazing how our theology cleans up when we watch people without family and realize family might work. Well, I want you to take it to the next level. And it's not just the family unit, the nuclear family. It's God not as a distant taskmaster, but God as your daddy. Yeah. And Jesus shows you what it's like to be a son. Hallelujah. And in Christ, we are the sons of God. Amen. Amen.